This is a story about tiny, rarely seen Australian possums, a catastrophic bushfire and a plant, hairpin banks here. I'm on a forest ridge near Batemans Bay, New South Wales, on Australia's southeast coast. This forest is only now recovering from the Curran fire, which swept through here beginning a few kilometres to the west in November 2019. It was just one of the huge wildfires that swept the east coast in that terrible summer. The forest had already been burned in mid-2019 in a routine hazard reduction operation. That was intended to prevent a hot wildfire in the summer months, but it didn't work. The Curran fire tore through the forest. It burned hot up this steep west-facing slope, destroying the forest canopy and killing many trees. Only the oldest and tallest trees survived with some foliage intact. It burned cooler down this gentle east-facing slope and there the canopy largely survived. But paradoxically, many native birds and animals are now relying on the heavily burned west-facing slope for food and shelter. Down here, there's a stand of hairpin banksias. These plants were burned to the ground in the hazard reduction and the subsequent wildfire, but they've regenerated spectacularly from their woody lignotubers under the soil. And they're providing a rich source of pollen and nectar. These aren't single flowers. They're an inflorescence, a woody spike with hundreds of small individual flowers arranged in neat vertical rows. By day, they're visited by honey eaters and insects, including ants, flies, and native and feral bees. But night is the time of the micro marsupials, when the same banksias are visited by tiny mouse-sized possums. There are two possum species here, the eastern pygmy possum and the feather-tailed glider, which is the world's smallest gliding mammal. These three micromarsupials are around the same size as the common introduced house mouse, which is also prevalent in the area, a well-known post-bushfire phenomena. The Curran fire began with a lightning strike on 26 November 2019 and burned until early February 2020 consuming 5,000 square kilometres. Within its boundaries, almost no bush survived without being burned. Millions of animals, countless billions if you include invertebrates, died. Those that survived could run fast, fly fast, 
lived underground or high up in the tree hollows that survived. On the eastern side of our forest ridge, where the Curwen fire had burned cooler downhill, thanks partly to the hazard reduction, virtually all the trees and the forest canopy survived. But there are very few banks here, and ground cover is sparse to non-existent. There are almost no old trees and few nest hollows here. On the western side, where the fire burned hot uphill, the destruction of the forest canopy, the subsequent influx of sunlight and the fire's ash bed has resulted in a strange, transient meadow of native grasses and herbs, springing up from seeds preserved perhaps for decades in the soil, and among them there are the banksias. But where did our micropossums shelter from the conflagration? Well, both species prefer to live in small tree hollows, although pygmy possums sometimes use disused bird nests or build their own nest in a thicket near the ground. So they might have survived in the few small hollows over on the eastern side of the ridge, or perhaps it was hare on the western side, in this old hollow tree, dead long years before the fire, or this tall ancient spotted gum with many hollow limbs which survived with much of its foliage intact. Both species can only have lived out the post-fire months in the remaining forest canopy, where there were some insects, gum exudate, blossoms and new green foliage, eking out a living until the regrowth began. Both are so small they require little food and both can enter a state of torpor for days, helping them survive through the post-fire famine. The heavily burned area, with its dense regrowth and tangle of fallen limbs, many of them hollow, provides all the small mammal species, the possums, the antichinus and the mice, with cover from predators at ground level and on the trunks of the regenerating trees. With their grasping feet and prehensile tails, pygmy possums and feather tail gliders negotiate the post-fire landscape with ease. In a masterly display of acrobatic skill, this pygmy possum leaps a half metre gap, grabs an overhanging regrowth branch, swings down on it, lets go, catches the rim of the hollow log with the tip of his tail, and hauls himself up. Feathertail gliders have the added advantage of being able to glide over 25 metres, but at a pretty steep rate of descent. That's useful and certainly safer than running across the ground, but they still have to climb up the tree they've landed on to regain height for the next glide. Closely, and you can see the glider's patagium, the strip of folded up skin between the elbows and the knees that becomes its wings when it stretches its legs. Woof, <laughs> woof, 
Eastern pygmy possums have a wide but patchy distribution, inhabiting shrubby vegetation in heath, shrubland, eucalypt forest and woodland, and rainforest, from southern Queensland around to southern South Australia, and on Tasmania and islands in the Bass Strait. The species first came to scientific notice when the French naturalist Françoise Perron, from the Baudin expedition, obtained a juvenile male from an Aboriginal inhabitant of Mariah Island off the southeast coast of Tasmania in February 1802. This unlucky animal, preserved in spirits, became the holotype, the specimen on which the scientific description and name of the new species was based. That description was finally published by the French zoologist Anselme Gaetan Desmarest 15 years later in 1817. It was assumed the pygmy possum lived only on Tasmania and nearby islands. Amazingly, it wasn't until 1863, 46 years later, that a European scientist, Gerard Crift of the Australian Museum, obtained a pygmy possum near St Leonard's on Sydney's North Shore and thought he'd found a new species. By then, European settlement was 75 years old and Sydney was a bustling city. Of course, all along, the species was well known to Aboriginal people. Feather-tailed gliders are found across the eastern seaboard of Australia from northern Queensland to Victoria and extreme southeastern South Australia, but unlike the pygmy possum, not in Tasmania. They inhabit a wide range of forest types, living mainly in the forest canopy, but occasionally descending to ground level to forage. The story of their scientific discovery could hardly have been more different to that of the eastern pygmy possum. They were noticed by European observers very shortly after the first fleet arrived at Sydney Cove in 1788. The anonymous artist known as the Port Jackson painter and Thomas Watling produced accurate drawings and Watling recorded the local Aboriginal name as Guro Guro. Hold on to that fact because it's a clue as to how Watling actually obtained the elusive little animal he drew. Promptly, in 1793, the new species was described and named by George Shaw, Assistant Keeper of Natural History at the British Museum, on the basis of specimens shipped back to London. So why the discrepancy? Why is it that the feather tail glider gets noticed by European naturalists and entered into the scientific catalogue of nature within five years of European settlement, but no naturalist recorded the pygmy possum in the greatest part of its range, the Australian mainland, until three quarters of a century had passed? Well, pygmy possums are tiny, nocturnal, mouse-like to the untrained eye, and live mostly in the treetops. Unless they visit a zoo, the vast majority of Australians will never lay eyes on one. But Aboriginal people lived as close to nature as you can and noticed just about every detail. Early European naturalists relied heavily on Aboriginal collectors to bring them species unknown to science. I reckon, in the case of the pygmy possum, through an accident of history, that just didn't happen before Aboriginal people were driven from their land. When you've found a good banksia dripping with nectar, you don't let anybody crash the party, even your own species.
and especially those pesky feral mice who might turn up anywhere, whatever you're doing, rudely interrupting you. Best to show them the teeth. You know, Jesse, I was looking at that 1863 illustration of two pygmy possums by John Gould. Gould was usually pretty accurate, but those two look really, really porky. And while pygmy possums do store fat at the base of their tails, I've never seen a photograph of one with a bulbous tail like that. So I thought Gould must have got it wrong. Turns out he didn't. That was, in fact, a pair of pygmy possums kept by Queen Victoria. The rich food and sedentary lifestyle at Windsor Castle had gone to their tails. True story, Jesse. If you like this video, please hit the red subscribe button and you'll be emailed when new videos about Australian wildlife and travel are uploaded.